Hello, my name is Tracy Tocahoma Espinosa. I'm a professor here at the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador, and it's a real pleasure to be with you today to try to share some of the information related to mind-brain education science and its connection to the environment, to what is social learning across the lifespan, and to try to see how this information impacts the way you work in your fields. Um, what I want to do today, if it's okay, is to divide this presentation into two parts. Um, to begin with, take a few minutes to try to give you some background information about the field of mind-brain education science. And then uh, in the second part, actually go into some more detail about the chapters that apparently you guys have already read. And um, try to then from that point on uh, do a Q&A session with you live uh, in, a, in the following weeks. I hope this works out for you. Please let me know if there's any way that we can also uh, correspond via email, which is in the prow uh, PowerPoint presentation that you'll be receiving. Thanks. Okay, to begin. Basics. What is mind-brain education science? Initially, uh, we were looking at the history of the field and it sort of emerged all around the world. And we find that these are generally, um, they can be people from all of these different fields. They can start off as teachers who want to integrate neuroscience into their, into their work. They can be psychologists who want to bridge neuroscience and education. While mind-brain and education science um, has three larger fields or three parent fields of neuroscience, psychology and education, each of these fields has actually um, several sub-elements. Sub so in neuroscience, you can look at issues of nutrition. You can also consider different aspects of the biological sciences that have to do with uh, sleep patterns and how that impacts learning. Um, when you look at psychology, you can also look at things related to uh, stress, stress in the workplace, how do people actually react or, or actually learn throughout the lifespan, given good or bad levels of stress and the other parent field of education. How do we actually learn? How do we actually teach um, so that people actually take in the information the best way possible across the lifespan? So what we want to do now is I want to give you a little bit of um, background information of where the information comes from. And from there, we can actually go into more of the, the specifics or some good examples of actually this field and what it me could mean in your own profession. Um, basically, there have been concepts, this is the premise of the whole idea is that there's been a lot of information out there that's just not high quality. Um, anything with the word brain in it is kind of sexy these days and everybody sort of buys into it. So there's a lot of commercialization of information that just doesn't stack up against the weight of evidence that exists in the field. So the main idea is that the reason it's important to actually uh, put parameters around the field give it some standards and actually talk about its real applications is to try to, number one, get rid of a lot of the myths that are in the field um, or myths about how the brain actually learns and its implications in the everyday workplace um, and then actually bring in good information. What are some standards we can use to sort of guide our own practice? How should we actually apply information and how do we know good information from bad? So that's the basic reason the, um, the, the information or the field is actually taken off. From there, um, one of the ways to actually sort of categorize the, the quality of information in the field is to use um, what was um, promoted by the OECD nations, 33 countries that agreed upon certain categorization, categorization of information in uh, education. These go from things that are well-established, information that uh, is of high quality, good evidence, lots of studies, uh, to information that is just probably so. It sounds likely, but we don't have full information or there might be some contradictory information. To things that are intelligent speculation. Uh, it seems obvious um, on the surface level, but when you actually dig, there really is no good quality information there to back it. And then pure neuromyths. So what I want to do right now is sort of give you an example of each of those areas so that you can um, try to begin to categorize those concepts on your own. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, the objective would be that um, hopefully at the end of this lesson, uh, people feel that they have the core competencies of the field. They have dominated the basic vocabulary of mind brain education science, um, that they're able to apply this in their daily life. They can judge the quality of information. And hopefully you've gained the attitude that um, this is actually valuable. It's a very valuable filter through which we can actually use to um, judge information, to use information, to apply it, and to actually maximize co uh, the learning potential that we all have throughout the lifespan. Okay, so premise, um, there's huge implications for the field of mind-brain education science, even though it has these three parent fields that carry over into the bio, psychosocial, environmental areas, and that hopefully 
uh, at the end of this session and during the Q&A that we'll have, you will be able to tell me or give me concrete examples in your own areas that actually apply this information. Um, the reason if I had to ask you why do we want to do this, we've always just existed with neuroscience, psychology, education, environmental studies, health, they've been separate fields. What is the point of uniting them? The main idea is that there are problems uh, in society today that are just so complex that after years, in some cases hundreds of years, we haven't been able to resolve these problems. Um, the belief that if you can join and have an interdisciplinary approach two problems, you are more likely to come up with a long-term solution. So the idea here is that yes, maybe neuroscience can give us a lot of ideas and maybe psychology on its own gives us a lot of ideas. Um, health studies gives us a lot of ideas all by itself. But the real idea is that there's power in numbers. One plus one is really three. I mean, you have a good idea here, a good idea there, but once they're joined together, you actually have something much more powerful than you would have um, looking at these fields by themselves or approaching a problem in a, in a simple linear fashion. So the idea is to try to help you or encourage you to be more uh, interdisciplinary in your manner of approaching problems. Um, okay, to begin with, we know quite a lot about how the brain learns, but we don't know very much about how to teach or how to coach or how to train or how to guide people to take advantage of that. So given that premise, we try to find a balance here. In um, MBE, we're trying to look at a balance between teaching and learning, and we're also looking at a balance of input from all of the different uh, parent fields. The information that you've seen in the, in the book is based originally on, uh, it started off as a PhD dissertation which was a grounded theory development. It was a meta-analysis of the literature um, for 30 years, um, including over 4,500 documents, which gave me an idea of what would be a new model of how we should actually approach um, the teaching and, and learning aspects of, of um, education. But this kind of grew um, when I incorporated a Delphi panel. The Delphi panel is a group of experts who uh, were mentioned continually by uh, peers in the field. People said, you know, I would reference this fellow, this person is actually great. And 39 names came up um, a lot of the time in all of these thousands of articles. So I invited those people to participate in this panel, uh, 20 of whom accepted straight away, and then I had input from um, six others, uh, five, sorry, five others after the fact um, who actually read the final document. But this meant we had input from people from all of these different parent fields and also from seven different countries from around the world. So the ideas that we're sharing today are not just sort of an American or Ecuadorian or whatever concept. They actually are accepted and shared um, perspectives from professionals from all around the world. Um, when the Delphi panel um, chimed in, we actually modified the model a bit and actually came up with this different categorization of different uh, information. Um, one of the things that happened after, post Delphi panel, was actually a comparison with the literature that exists in the field. And what was quite sad was that um, about 80% of what teachers are given as great information or in in-services actually was poor information, low quality, had no evidence behind it, but it had the word brain in it. It was quite sexy in itself. And so uh, different concepts um, were very much shot down by the Delphi panel. Things like uh, Brain Gym and Baby Mozart and some other things like that were actually um, really, um, well, there were several scientific articles that were presented to actually say why these things should not be uh, incorporated into our daily fare. And so um, that was part of the surprising information. It was confirming what we'd suspected. But it actually, um, it's a call uh, to be much more cautious, to be much more um, skeptical consumers of information that's thrown at us about what works and what doesn't work related to um, brain issues. Some of the surprising findings that uh, came out of the study included um, things that many people from some fields, softer sciences like psychology, had always um, um, stood next to uh, concepts that they truly believe in but which hadn't had a lot of hired science behind them now do. For example, the great impact of uh, affect and learning. I mean, how you feel uh, whether it's a stress level or whether it's a motivational level, has a huge impact on uh, how well you can learn. So we know that creating good learning environments, whether it's in the workplace or in a school, has a huge impact on whether or not people actually end up um, dominating new information. Okay, We'll look at some of those specific examples in the second part.
Um, I'll be sharing with you the list of all of the people who participated on the Delphi panel, but they were an even mix of people from neuroscience, psychology, and education. Um, all of them were very active participants, and it was quite um, it's a wonderful group. It's an intellectually generous group of people who very much um, wanted to share and do believe in bridging these fields. We looked at a lot of issues. We looked at things related to neuroimaging, um, to neurotransmitters, chemicals, neurogenesis, plasticity, theories of consciousness, belief about uh, intelligence, uh, new learning theories, neuroethics. Is it correct? Now that we can have brain scans that actually will tell you this person is dyslexic, is it ethical then to oblige people to put that information up front or will that label actually cause a, a longer term problem? Um, and an issue that, uh, or an area that I'm sure is of most interest to your group is related to mind-body connections. Things related to sleep, uh, physical exercise, nutrition, um, as well as environments uh, where a person works. How do all of those things impact a person's ability to learn across a lifespan? We looked at school subjects, but we also looked at things that impact your life skills. Um, affect, empathy, emotions, motivation, attention, uh, executive functions, decision making, um, facial recognition, interpretation, memory, social cognition, spatial management, time management. All of these things uh, were based on um, solid studies that we found and actually they give us hints as to how we should actually approach uh, teaching or learning in, um, exchanges. Um, the panel looked at 11 different issues, including the name of the field. This is why we don't call this brain-based learning or we don't call it brain anything. The idea is uh, the, the concept of joining um, and not making brain the dominant issue, but saying you have mind, comma, brain, comma, and I see in your class health, comma, and education. The idea that all of these things are on an equal footing was very, very important to the group, that it should not be neuropsychology because neuro is a sub-element of psychology, but rather these were, an, it, this uh, new field is an even, uh, evenly based field with equal input from all of the parent, um, parent um, uh, fields of study. We looked into the academic roots, which historically, where does this field come from? We defined terms. We looked at the overarching uh, research practice and policy goals, which I'll be sharing with you in just a second. Uh, the general history of the field. Who are the thought leaders of the fields? What would be logical steps or filters through which we can pass information to say this is good information, this is not so good information? Um, Organizations and the societies that are uh, new in this field, you guys obviously know. Um, I, I did my master's at Harvard and loved it. Too bad they didn't have MBA at that time. But um, there are different institutions around the world that actually now have degrees in this area. Um, and the main um, focus was on actually categorizing different concepts and how it is that they are either given, uh, they're well established, they're probably so, they're either intelligence, speculation, or they're just myths. Um, and then the idea would be, uh, at the end of the day, what do you do with this information? How do we enhance communication between the fields to make sure that this interdisciplinary exchange can actually turn into uh, real-life professional uh, exchanges in, in, uh, in society? Um, we used uh, the information on the beliefs and the neuromyths. That helped develop into things that were going to be the new principles or tenets. Principles are things that are generally universal structures in the brain, how the brain actually does process or use information, but tenants are things that are equally true, however, um, there's a huge variety in, um, in, human, um, in the human span of things in the spectrum. For, so for example, um, nobody will deny that sleep is important for learning. Um, but how much sleep is very debatable. With the average person, you get a beautiful bell curve and most people need about eight hours of sleep. However, some people, between four and a half and 12 is not rare. I mean, that is actually accepted. And so, so if you, um, you can't prescribe that you need eight hours of sleep to have, actually be able to learn well, or that your employees, uh, let's say that they're working night shifts. Is this an uh, intelligent way to go about uh, doing things? Well, if you want them to learn new things, probably not. If you want them to be alert, there's some debate there. But uh, the f effects on memory, well, does it have anything to do with the context of their job? Um, but doctors, doctors with strange shifts that work three days in a row, how important is it to understand their personal sleep patterns and how does this impact their uh, ability to work well in the healthcare profession? So from the principles and the tel and, uh, uh, tenants, you actually come up with a um, set of guidelines. How could we actually approach um, new teaching and learning experiences in the future? Um, 
To put this into context, um, I want to close by just uh, letting you know about those four categories again. What's well established, an example, a concrete example, has to do with plasticity. The brain is highly plastic. It changes uh, throughout the lifespan. Um, we know that most of these changes are happening on a microscopic level, and that has to happen before you'll see a change in behavior. So you might be trying over and over and over again to make something clear to a student or a kid. For example, if any of you have ever taught a, someone to read, you'll watch that you can spend weeks and you know, go over the same thing over and over and try different ways to get information to this kid's heads. You can go through phonemes, you can go through sentence patterns, you can read aloud to them, you can try all kinds of different things and feel that you're not making any pr uh, progress. But then one day, all of a sudden, the kid reads. Now that didn't happen just then. That happened over several, several, several intentions of trying to create these connections in the brain. So we know that the plasticity of the brain is actually just another word for saying learning. Your brain learns, that's a, that's a demonstration of plasticity. On the other extreme, we know that plasticity has to do with um, damage. There are people who have experienced damage to their brain, who have fully recuperated um, and actually used or recruited other parts of their brain to do things that were typically associated with one area, which is why we don't ever talk about localizationalism anymore. It's not left brain, right brain. There's hugely intricate systems in the brain, and if we can learn to appreciate that the brain is not that simple, we can actually come up with a lot of um, more creative ways to approach learning. So the idea of plasticity is something that's well established. Uh, nobody doubts that anymore, proven in human beings, not only in animals. And so we say that well established issues um, include um, plasticity. Something that's probably so has to do with the concept of sensitive period. It's, we will no longer say there is a critical period for just about anything and definitely not for academic subjects. Um, critical periods, the only two that were highly debated by the Delphi panel included learning your first language and or uh, mobility, walking um, in early ages. And there were there are very few examples of this. Nobody's gonna offer up their kid and let's do an experiment and let me isolate him for eight years and see if he actually can learn language after that period. We don't have a lot of cases. Um, there's cases of feral children, um, but they're around 200. We don't have enough information to actually make that generalization. But one of the things that the Delphi panel wanted to be very clear about is that there's no critical period for any academic subject for learning a second or third language. There's no critical period for learning certain math concepts. The emphasis is rather on the stages, the process, the developmental and constructivist way that we actually build upon prior knowledge. So um, the order of steps of learning a skill is far more important than the age. So we know that there, we believe highly it's probably so, but we don't have conclusive evidence because you can't discard a few things because there's just not um, a way to isolate or experiment for that. The third category are things that are in intelligent speculation. For example, gender differences. Um, in all the studies that exist, there are only four, five if you include total size, uh, physical differences in brains between men and women. And there's not one study that shows that that translates into changes in um, behavior. You do have a ton of studies that talk about hormones and very well established that differences in hormone levels actually have an impact on behavior. And of course the brain controls hormones. However, the physiology of the brain is not to be blamed or is not to be credited with uh, differences that are in the brain. There's a couple of wonderful research books out that I can recommend um, that actually really sum up the information there. Um, the reason it's intelligent it's speculation is because you look at the outside of a person, you look at men, you look at women, you say, well, they look different from the outside, therefore things must be different on the inside in their brains. Uh, it's intelligent speculation, but it's just not enough evidence to say that that's true. Uh, then there's categories of things that are myths, just pure myths. Right brain, left brain learners. How many brains do you have? You have one brain. You can have hemispheres, um, but there's not even just activities isolated uh, to single hem hemisphere. There is almost, there's nothing you do in your, in your life, in your daily affair, that involves just one hemisphere. It's a highly intricate system. It's very easy to sell the concept of right and left brain because it sort of compartmentalizes uh, ideas and lets, you know, teach to the right brain and all this other stuff. But that's just uh, baloney. Neuromyth, neuromyth. Okay, so those are the four categories. Once they were categorized by the Delphi panel, um, I took that information and I went back and I used um, 
information from the best evidence encyclopedia and the What Works Clearinghouse to actually do total number of case studies or number of people uh, who actually um, participated in uh, studies in these areas to confirm what the Delphi panel had said or, or how the Delphi panel categorize these different um, different concepts. And those are the things that we're actually going to look at in, um, in the second part uh, of our, of our, our talk. Um, to close, I just want to leave you with a few things that are challenges. We have um, lots of problems in society and things are very, very complex and the days are over where we specialize that you are a chemist or you are a health professional or you are just a, you are someone who works as a preschool teacher or you're somebody uh, who is a biologist, whatever it is. Your days are numbered if you think that's all you do. There are no problems in society that can be answered um, through a single lens. So the idea of using mind brain education, mind brain education in health, the idea of looking at this interdisciplinary approach is actually much, much more powerful than exist in, um, in uh, past days where we thought that we had to be very, very um, linear in, in our approach. Now we know that if we don't look at this through a variety of lenses, we're missing a lot of information. So we have to nurture ourselves from the other professions. Um, and the second point is that there's a lot of things out there that are being said and sold um, that are just not true and this impacts our profession in a very important way that we have to learn to filter that information. In standards, um, what have, was agreed upon by the Delphi panel is that standards that exist in the existing parent fields of neuroscience, psychology, education, your case health, these should be uh, anything that goes through MBE, MBA, HB, already. The idea is that anything that um, is accepted in the field of mind-brain education, mind-brain education health, um, should stand up to the standards of each of those separate fields as well as uh, the general standards of the new field, which means that we're not just saying standards in one field and standards in the other and the intersection as in a Venn diagram, the intersection are the standards. No, we're saying the standards in one, the standards plus another, and the standards plus another are equal to the standards that have to be met um, for a concept, for something to be applied in the new field. So this is much harder. It means it's a much more stringent um, way to judge information. We also know that in research goals, um, the concept, the idea to do research, and I understand you guys are all going to be doing research projects, um, when you see that there's a very clear guidelines, um, things that establish a working understanding of the dynamic relationships between how we learn, how we educate, how the brain constructs new learning, and how the brain organizes and processes information, there's some very clear guidelines about what would qualify as a research um, project in these areas. Um, additionally, there's practice goals. Uh, we want to be able to align learning and teaching and how human beings are organ uh, biologically organized to learn. There's several practice guidelines. What do we actually do on a daily basis that actually applies these concepts? Um, the future? The future is you guys. I mean, what can you do? Uh, we have to extend um, a hand to people outside of our own field of formation, and we actually have to look into joint research projects, which I hope you will do in this class. Um, you have to cross disciplines, and you have to be open to information that might be outside of your field. But to be able to do that, you have to dominate a vocabulary that's very different now. You have to be able to learn to speak the language of mind-brain education, which um, expands our vocabulary in a lot of different ways. Um, educators have to learn to talk about the brain. And uh, neuroscientists have to understand that feedback loops don't just have to do with uh, chemistry, but they have to do with things that happen in a classroom. So we have to be able to learn to, to use each other's vocabulary in that sense. We're going to close here for this first part, and um, what we'll look at next has to do with um, breaking down the information that you've reviewed in the book so far, and um, after that we'll do a question and answer session. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and today we're going to look over the first uh, few chapters of Mind Brain Education Science, which is a comprehensive guide to the new brain-based teaching, which I have to say uh, the title was kind of a compromise there. We wanted to get away from the words brain-based, but anyways, we've, we've kept it in here for this purpose. What we're going to do is actually look over, in the table of contents you'll see that um, there's some very important information in the preface that I want to talk to you about. Then I'm going to jump to chapters 1, which actually is trying to define the field. Chapter 2, which actually goes over what is the evidence-based information in the field and how we actually um, categorize information that applies or doesn't apply in the field. 
And then we're going to look at some of the, um, the historical information in Chapter 3, exactly where does this information come from. It's not a new field, but it just has a, a very different label now. In Chapter 4, we're going to look through the science and the myths, actually trying to get away from the neuromyths that um, have plagued uh, information in the popular press. In Chapter 5, we're going to actually look at um, the research and actually look at who is studied, why they are studied, um, and how the different studies are conducted in this new field of mind-brain education. Uh, chapter 6, we're going to look at human uh, survival skills and different life skills. So there's some things that the brain actually does to preserve itself, which are survival things, and there's other things that the brain does uh, related to life skills, like being able to memorize things or to pay attention to different information. In Chapter 7, we look at the laboratory in the classroom. Uh, really trying to understand certain uh, specific key areas in teaching and learning, such as language and math, and actually how we can apply the new information to those specific content areas. Chapter 8 is evidence-based solutions in the classroom, so how we can actually go about filtering information. And Chapter 9, we look at the conclusions. Basically, what is it that we now know and where should we go from here in order to actually um, continue to develop the field. Starting in um, Chapter... sorry in the preface. I'd like to call your attention to the preface. You can skip the introduction if you don't have a lot of time, but in the preface I think it's quite important to um, acknowledge that the information we're presenting is, is trying to actually reach a type of standardization. It's trying to say what is good information, what is poor information, how do we judge that information so that we can be better practitioners, especially in education where things are done so much on an individual level, it's very, very hard to say that this thing works for all children. It might work for this child, but not for others. So we need to actually try to find ways to better uh, make judgments about that kind of a practice. What we... Um, what is vital to understand is that we're talking about the mix of education, cognitive neuroscience and educational psychology, which ends up being mind, brain and education um, science in, this, uh, in these terms. Now we also look at what is um, the subfield. So when we're talking about education, we're talking about a lot of things like educational practice, methodology, content of subject matter, age group, uh, knowledge, how to teach older kids, younger kids, classroom management skills, differentiation, planning, assessment. Um, in terms of educational research, uh, philosophy and technology, all of these different points are considered in this education element. In neuroscience, we're looking at the nervous system, brain, neurons, synapses, neurotransmitters, neural networks, sensory systems, motor control, learning, memory condition, arousal mechanisms. We're talking very specifically about cognitive neuroscience. And a key thing to remember is that the studies in this field are only um, they can be started off with animal studies, but they are only focused really on results found with real human beings. So, uh, for example, you can find a lot of information in animal uh, neuroscience that says, yes, there's differences in the brains uh, between sexes uh, or between, uh, well, a, a male moth and a female moth. Yeah, you can actually see some differences there and same thing in rats, but you can't find that in humans. So the whole idea is to actually focus on human uh, studies here. And in psychology, there's a lot of different issues in consciousness, perception, emotion, personality, behavior, cognition, uh, interpersonal relationships. What is uh, very important to realize is these lists are not conclusive. There's a whole lot of other information. And if you look at how different fields uh, overlap, there's a lot of other things that should be taken into consideration. For example, you'll find that there are subfields in neuroscience that are quite important as well. So, for example, if you have... Um, in neuroscience, you might have a branch that says, okay, what are biological studies? What is information that we can actually glean from the biological sciences? And there you actually cross over with a lot of things related to health and nutrition. So areas that you are all very uh, involved in are actually very important um, as well in mind-brain education science. They're just not um, broken down in um, such a, a fine way here um, in the initial pages here or in that particular diagram, but they are included. Okay, in chapter one, we're actually looking at uh, a celebration, basically saying, finally, let's give this new uh, field a name. Let's actually, it's culminating in the birth of something that actually um, happened all around the world um, at more or less the same time, which is kind of a, a very interesting, um, spontaneous uh, kind of a, a movement where many, many different places around the world, Japan, Australia, UK, United States, there were many different researchers who were actually looking into this field and actually sort of declared that it existed um, around 2004, 5, 6. Um, and earlier years, Kurt Fisher at Harvard claims that there's a lot of um, 
uh, pre-evidence in the 1990s that were leading up to this 2001 when they were planning the mind brain education um, degree in uh, Harvard uh, itself and so this has been talked about for a long time but it hasn't actually it didn't actually occur until this um, 2004 five six time um, what's important to realize is that one of the things that has stopped or made it so slow to reach the actual birth of this new learning science was that each of these different fields, psychology, neuroscience, education, we can add um, the health sciences here as well, they all have their own epistemology, they all have their own philosophy, they have a very deep history, and all of those things um, really have a huge influence in the way of um, that you change your lens with uh, the way you look at different problems. So you'll have a neuroscientist who's always looking for things that are related to cells at a cellular level. And you'll have a psychologist who's always looking for things on a behavioral level. And then you'll also find that, you know, in education, we're looking at groupthink sometimes and how our schools run. So since they have all these different lenses, they're approaching problems differently. And this is something to be celebrated. It's not something that is to be lamented. It's actually a positive thing when we can actually join these visions. But the very interesting perspective here is that we're mixing some very young sciences. Psychology is only about 125 years old, right? Neuroscience... Um, was only really established around 1989, so cognitive neuroscience is a very young field. So we're mixing two 125-year-old uh, fields with a 25-year-old field, which is nothing compared to things like philosophy or biology, which have been around for thousands of years. So we're actually looking at something quite new, which has taken a long time to, to actually take hold, which has been part of our problem in the field, as people sort of wondered whether or not it was a, a subset of something else. And the other thing has to do with the commas, the mind, comma, brain, comma, education, and you've added health to this whole fix. The idea is when you have fields that are um, joined in that way, you don't have one that's superior to another. There is such a field as uh, neuropsychology, which means the neuro is a subfield of psychology. And there's educational neuroscience, but that means education is a sub-element of neuroscience. The idea with the MBE um, balance is that all of these things are actually treated equally, and there's input, input um, on an equal, uh, equal level from all of these different areas. Um, to take this even further, when you actually include health into this discussion, it's, uh, it's very important because the dynamics um, it really lend themselves to that. When we see, um, uh, and later on we're going to look at the mind-brain connection, there's a huge connection there between um, how what is done to the body actually um, um, changes very much the, the mind's potential. Okay, that's so much for Chapter 1. In Chapter 2, what we're actually trying to establish is that what we're looking at are not uh, suggested um, um, popular um, cure-it-alls, um, one-size-fit-all type of things for, for different, um, for the field of education or for any other field. We're actually trying to say that there's a lot of good evidence that should be looked at and always taken into consideration. And then there's a lot of junk out there that we actually have to just uh, get rid of. So the idea is to take these old questions, how do we learn best? What is individual human potential? How do we ensure that children learn, uh, live up to their promise as learners? All these things are, are very, very old. These are questions that we've uh, philosophized for, for thousands of years. And so right now the idea is actually trying to come to grips with a new way to approach this with a new type of vocabulary. As I mentioned earlier in Chapter 1, you have a difference here between, for example, you have between neuroscience psychology, you have things that are in the uh, life and natural sciences. You have biology and genetics. You have nutrition issues, um, psychopharmacology. You have a lot of things that are actually also highly related to the information here. But you also have things that are on the outside um, related to society, societal values, um, anthropological or cultural anth anthropological issues that should be taken into consideration. Um, within psychology, you also have um, uh, the range looking at time, it may basically. So if you have issues related to um, genetic issues, but you also have developmental psychology across a lifespan, what can and should be learned by human individuals? Um, there was a big, there has been a very big discussion about, well, how come this isn't just brain-based learning? Or why isn't this just called educational neuroscience? Or educational neuropsychology? or just plain old neuroscience. And the debate um, actually came to head with the Delphi panel that, um, that I ran in 2008, which made it very clear that it was, there was a need to actually establish this as a separate field, because without it, um, 
other fields dominated in their, in their lens, the lens with which they began to look at a problem. How does a child read? Well, if it was a neuroscientific lens, there's a lot of analysis going on about information we now know about dyslexic brains. And so the focus was uh, overly dominated by that. Uh, where psychologists were saying, well, that you're sure changing actually a child's own um, general aptitude is feeling, is motivation for learning to read. We, we can't let that go. And educators were saying, wait a second, just tell me what actually works in the classroom. Give me some better tools. So um, the choice was made to actually um, decide that this is its own field. It's not something that's a subfield of other fields. Okay. The other point that's very important in chapter two is to distinguish that there is a, we know a lot, I mean, well, we don't know a whole lot, but relatively speaking, we know far more about learning how the brain learns versus how to teach. There's been a whole lot of studies going on um, and basically all of psychology has actually looked at that, its whole history over the past 125 years is how do we learn best? How do we learn behaviors? And um, what's very important, and Sarah Jane Blakemore and Ordo Frith in, in, in the UK have really pointed this out really, out really clearly. Every animal can learn, but very, very few teach or teach each other. And none but the human being tries to learn better ways to teach or to, make, uh, to take advantage of the potential of the human brain to teach better. So there is a discussion also as to whether or not this is a discipline or professional field that actually still continues, that whole debate still continues today. And then the idea is where is it actually applied? How is MBE science actually applied? So one of the concrete examples, and we'll look at this later on in chapter eight, relates to actually um, information. How do you join information from the different fields? So if you know that there are, for example, different neural pathways for a representation of three, when it's written out as, as an Arabic number, or when it's written out in letters, or when it's a Roman numeral, or whether or not it's just actually represented in a physical uh, manifestation like balls, um, that those are different, those are stored in different places in the brain. Now that's a curiosity, but it also should tell us something about how to teach uh, the concept or the concept of three. Okay, there is a lot of conceptual debates in the field, and these are actually also dis uh, discussed a lot in um, chapter two, and um, methodology, actually um, processes. How should information um, be judged, whether it's good or bad or not? And so there's suggested processes that um, a, an educator might take versus a psychologist versus somebody from, um, from the neurosciences. So if you're a psychologist, um, you've got a theory about uh, teaching and learning. Then the idea is, okay, now does, is there also evidence that this is something that could be put in practice in a classroom? And is there evidence in neuroscience for this? And if you can find that all three fields support the information, then you can actually have a very uh, high rate of confidence in the information that you're sharing. If you find that it's only supported in one or two of the three fields, then we realize that that information is probably suspect still and that we have to be very careful um, about that. The rest of chapter two actually shows how neuroscience can inform pedagogy, how pedagogy can inform psychology, how psychology can inform neuroscience. So basically we've got these six pairs here of how each of the different fields can in practicality enrich the other um, through good content information. So that's what chapter two actually uh, sets out to, to do is to actually justify why this new field is needed and why it's actually and how it can be applied. Um, in the end of chapter two, we actually look at something, just sort of the old question. We're not telling people a lot of new information. There is a lot of stuff out there that we've known forever, uh, but now we can say with great confidence that there exists information in neuroscience and in psychology and in education, which gives us pause to think, well, if we can find learning interventions that apply all of those things, then we would actually be better off. So for example, there's five well-established uh, concepts. One is that the that human brains are as unique as, as uh, human faces. That is, they have similar parts, but there are no two alike. We also know that all brains are not equal because context and ability influence learning. So people are not all born to address all of the same kind of problems with equal success. This is actually very sad uh, to people who were formed in psychology in the 70s who were told that, you know, give me anybody and I can shape them, you know, with the right modeling and with the right kind of stimulus, I can actually turn anybody into anything. Well, we just know that's not true anymore. And the third point is that the brain is changed um, daily by experience. Although most of these changes are at a microscopical level and you don't see that uh, manifested in um, behavior until far later. Uh, the fourth point is that the brain is highly plastic. This means that it can adapt 
it is adjustable. Your brain can um, change. And this is important for people in, um, in therapy, for example, in psychology, who uh, can go through many, many years trying to unravel um, certain patterns in their brain, but then they actually come up to understand, well, yes, you know, we can make new links, and this can take years. So it's kind of an appreciation of why, why this actually happens. In the fifth point, we realize that there is no, no new learning that does not pass through the filter of old learning. So basically your brain, the first thing it does is double, does a double check with anything it already knows. So this gives us great um, direction, great ideas about how we should actually teach. Um, and we know now that it's uh, why some of these um, teaching interventions are more successful than others because they are more authentic, they relate to a child's past experience. Uh, the whole concept of constructivist learning is based on this idea that we all learn from our past. Okay, that's chapter two. In chapter three, we look at some of the older problems, some of the things that have plagued ed education for a very long time, um, and then uh, try to see if there's any new way to take a look at these things. So basically, if we go back to the history of education, this is actually one of my favorite chapters because it's very, very um, interesting to see how mind-brain education science is actually quite natural when you look at where it came from and how it sort of developed and how different ideas built upon each other. We know that from the Egyptians to the Greeks um, things remain pretty much the same. There was a lot of core information which is very very interesting and a lot of things that were um, seated in um, in religious practice or a lot in, in philosophical studies. So this is um, a key uh, concept. One of my favorite findings in this research was to realize that um, Confucius actually said, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, we should differentiate education or basically teach according to the student's ability. Um, this is something that's uh, quite an old concept now we realize, but it's something that now is very much in, in the forefront of, our, of information because we now know that we can't treat all people the same and we do need to be able to differentiate uh, education. We keep all the same objectives, but we have to either evaluate or use different um, activities that actually reach that person due to their very unique brains. Um, there's a great focus between the 10th and 17th centuries on um, the senses and learning and perhaps the first, the first scientist, Alhazen, was, was, um, was acknowledged as being perhaps the first um, scientist to actually go through and, and actually practice and actually preach about um, a scientific method. Um, in the um, 1500s, a uh, fabulous, fabulous time to actually start to document um, in, a, in a more long-term way and to try to uh, uniformly identify parts of the brain. This was done um, by da Vinci, uh, no less. Um, also, Andreas Vesalius also did a lot of work in this area. And it was very fascinating to find that Christopher Wren, one of these most famous architects, right, um, who has to actually be one of the first to, to come up with a very, very precise rendition of what the human brain looks like, little factory bulbs there. Everything is very, very clearly drawn. Um, these uh, drawings have uh, survived and they've actually proven to be very, very accurate. So what was done in the time was actually, uh, back in the 1500s, 1600s, this actually helped us start to uniformly address different parts of the brain. On a philosophical and educational level, this whole concept of I think, therefore I am by René Descartes in the 1600s um, sort of gave way to a more educational philosophy of, of are we looking at the brain-centered uh, human being. If a person doesn't think, then they definitely don't exist. So this was actually taken, um, and it's still debated today, right? In the 18th and 19th century, finally, for the first time, at the end of the 1800s uh, in the United States, we actually start to have formalized education. So uh, beforehand, we would teach. We would be more individualized because you'd basically teach whoever was in your classroom in the one one room schoolhouse. Everybody mixed together, but then starting in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, uh, we start to have a more uniformity in education. And by the end of the 1890s, um, most countries uh, around the world, United States, Japan, China, began um, seeking a basic uh, type of educational structure, started obliging and saying, well, this would be a minimum level and this is how we will advance kids. And so actually there were no grades in American classrooms until around the 1890s when we started to actually have to promote people. So this is a, another very interesting concept. Uh, related to neuroscience, there is an old and outdated uh, concept called localizationalism, which basically means that X is located in Y part of the brain, and if you lose it, that's the end of it. So. 
the idea is if you had, and this was spun by the discoveries of um, Paul Broca and Karl Wernick uh, in uh, the 1800s, in which they discovered that certain parts of the human brain were related um, definitely to language. So in terms of language production or language um, perception and understanding. So in unifying those ideas, we, they realized that when a patient had a stroke, for example, in Broca's area, um, then they suffered a certain type of language loss. Now, this type of aphasia then led people to this overgeneralization of the concept that, well, once you've lost that place or that piece of your brain, that piece of your brain is the only thing related to language, therefore it's gone, therefore you'll never speak again. So it's taken um, a good 150 years to actually kind of get out of that mentality of localizationalism and to accept the idea that actually there can be rehabilitation of different parts of the brain thanks to plasticity. Um, going into the 1869, more or less, um, Francis Galton, who uh, spread this basic concept um, of learning and intelligence, and is this nature or nurture, this whole debate, which still remains today, um, what is most important, um, that emerged also at the end of the 1800s, which is a very important debate. This chapter includes some pictures related to brain mapping, originally Bodman's areas, which were actually um, developed. Uh, trying to uniform the way we related to different parts of the brain and trying to understand what they were important for. Now this is also promoting the idea of localizationalism. If you don't have something in your motor cortex, you're not going to be able to uh, run or walk or whatever, so or talk. So the idea here is um, now we look at these areas and we agree that they are incredibly important for certain functionings, but they're part of intricate systems. It's not just that single piece or part, but it's actually the whole system that we have to look at. Um, by the end of the, when we reach into, into the 1900s, 1950s, um, Donald uh, Hebb made a, a very uh, important um, uh, statement, a very good concept that had to do with what are now known as the, as the Hebbian synapse, or the idea that neurons that fire together wire together. This idea is basically summarizing the concept that if you uh, do two things together um, simultaneously, then they will be strengthened. So. This sort of takes a concept from psychology, you know, Pavlov's idea if we ring a bell and the dog comes running and he starts to salivate and we give him food, well then eventually you just ring the bell and he'll start to salivate. So we've connected two ideas in the brain, so there's a reaction. The idea that Hebb had in 1949 was basically, it was very similar to this, that if there's enough, uh, if things happen together, they will actually stimulate the firing uh, of neurons that are near them, okay? Um, very, very important uh, to mind brain and education science is the work of Jean Piaget, who made um, a point of, of identifying different stages of cognitive development. Um, he gave broad ranges of, of ages related to this, but it was basically showing that the human brain and the human being developed certain things throughout their lifespan, uh, which ranged from these basic simple, uh, these um, six stages, from simple reflexes to first habits, then secondary circular reactions, coordination of circular reactions, tertiary uh, circular reactions, and internalization of schemas. This idea uh, led to basically the stages of cognitive development that he, um, he has made very famous and that are still used today. The sensory motor stage, the pre-operational period, the concrete operational stage, and formal operational stage. Um, these generally coincide with certain ages, um, though there is great flexibility, but this is still used very much as a marker today. Um, some of the different concepts that um, sort of have shown that Piaget was not only right, but he was actually um, very, very much on target when he talked about certain mental constructs that, student, that kids develop throughout their lifespan. So the, the concept of serration or transitivity, classification, decentering, reversibility, conservation, all of these concepts, and moving away from egocentrism, all of these things are very, very important in, in, in uh, the development throughout the lifespan. And each of these has now actually um, begun to, been, uh, to be studied in the neuroscientific field, in mind brain education science, where we can actually show how the brain is changing in these different stages. From here we move on to the social, historical, and psychological concepts in child development, where Lev Vygotsky plays a very big role we talk about scaffolding or actually um, putting a child into situations where it's just a little bit harder than he can actually do on his own, but in the context of uh, other individuals who can actually model for him is a huge concept. So 
Um, in the first um, instance, uh, Vygotsky was very important in the, related to the zone of, cognitive, of proximal development, but then he was also very well known and actually, actually something that's still being discussed today has to do with this concept of an inner voice. Uh, the question of whether or not you can think without words, for example, or is your world defined by the words you have to, to think about it in? And so this whole um, idea about whether or not uh, a child, for example, in, in studies on bilingualism, which I love, um, you can actually see parts of the brain that are being used to think about words, even though you might not see a, a production or actually use, uh, semantic use of the words um, orally, you can actually see the brain uh, using different parts of the brain um, to come up with this. So are we actually thinking in words even though we don't have the words coming out of our mouth? It's a very, very, very interesting concept. Also in this chapter, we're looking at um, Alexander Luria's influence, who was phenomenal in his documentation of the mind of a newest, uh, someone who actually had a, uh, a near-perfect memory and how tragic that was, how tragic it was to actually have a perfect memory and how important it is to actually forget so this actually links to some other concepts in, later on that we'll see in the book related to memory and the importance of forgetting, for example, that um, what uh, Daniel Satcher has written quite a lot about. In the 60s and 80s, um, there was this big move uh, based on the fact, and unfortunately on, um, on rat studies, which was a wonderful start, but actually got things going in the wrong direction for education or educational publications. Uh, Rosenweg and, and his colleagues published um, some studies that actually showed, um, in coordination with uh, Marion Diamond, who's now at Berkeley, that uh, when a rat was put in a cage with lots of toys and stuff like that, then we sacrifice the rat and we open up the brain and we see that it's got a lot more dendrites than the rat who was in the empty cage. And when sharing those results, everybody got all excited and said, well, this speaks a lot to enriched environments. We need to give kids more enriched environments. Um, this was never the intention of the original authors, however, and who actually in, in later studies basically said, sorry, wait, w this is being misinterpreted. Um, the authors sh said that enriched, uh, or what looked like enriched initially in the laboratory environments are actually more like normal. I mean, rats live in, you know, tremendously entertaining sewers, and so their brains or the normal situation would be to have all of these activities or these uh, spinning wheels or whatever. So what this actually showed was not that enrichment is good for your brain, but rather that deprived environments are bad for your brain. So despite this, however, there's this great million dollar industry that still works on, on creating enriched environments. This is something that's really um, discussed and debated a lot uh, in the mind-brain education field right now because um, enrichment can only be defined um, in relative terms to the individual. So I take three newborn kids and I put them in an enrichment class and um, they come and three of those kids come from you know really depraved environments and this is a wonderful experience for them and, and I bet they do grow, they benefit from that experience. And let's say three of the other kids, um, basically their environment is the same. So they're not gaining and they're not losing. But then I take some other kids out of a tremendous house environment where they've got a lot of stimulation and people talking to them and great toys. And I take them to this enrichment class, which has less uh, things to do, less people around them. And that's actually a negative for the kids. So saying that enrichment, yes, enrichment is good. But how do we define that? I mean, how do you know what is enrichment from one person to another? That's a very, very difficult problem that we still have. The pre-mind brain and education science stage was actually in the in the early 70s, late 60s, um, and actually I think Dartmouth should be applauded in this. They actually had an undergraduate degree in educational neuroscience in 1968. Um, and they actually uh, founded the an, um, well the school itself in 1990. So they had um, actually a wonderful program going from the from the get go. In the 70s, we start looking at uh, very elaborate studies related to attention and memory, which are very important. And then we find that there's also in the 60s is a start of a focus on emotions and learning, which was very, very huge. Um, this was the first time that we actually realized that there are things such as an affective uh, filter hypothesis or things go through um, a judgment call from your emotions before they actually go into um, a cognitive realm. And so the attention to this area was very important, um, but it was very young um, in the earlier stages in the 60s and 70s. Um, but this quickly grew and it's still growing today. One of the greatest people in this field um, uh, 
I think Antonio Damasio has, has got a prize student, uh, Mary Helen Nimur Deng Yang, who's doing amazing work in this, in this area today and doing a lot of wonderful uh, research related to affect and learning. Um, then we started to see um, actually the emergence of what would be a new field. We started looking into psychopharmacology and seeing a lot more information related to treating quote unquote problems or learning problems through drugs or through the interaction or understanding or, or our, our, our infantile understanding really of the brain at that time to say yes we need to we can actually uh, control kids for example with attention problems by actually controlling the balance of neurotransmitters in the brain so this began to be more and more um, of interest um, in the 70s um, some very pioneering institutions began to emerge in the 70s the Japan Society for Neuroscience also in Australia there were some very big um, movements going on there and then the miracle happened. We actually got tons of funding put into brain studies in the 90s. Um, we have always had, since the 70s, we've had neuroimaging techniques. Um, and this goes back to the basic fundamentals of the brain. You can measure brain activity either through electrical or chemical um, uh, changes, or you can do it through um, physiology, I mean, basic changes in the physical structure of the brain. So what we had known since the 70s was related to uh, measuring electrical information. This was popular in the 70s. It was even founded, though, much earlier in 1929, believe it or not. Um, we actually have other information related to CAT scans, also in the 70s, PET scans in the 70s. And then we started to have far better and higher quality imaging with functional magnetic um, resonance imaging in the 90s. Um, there started to be uh, writings um, in mind-brain education science 1981, the very first thesis in this field, is entitled Neuroeducation, Brain Compatible Learning Strategies, was written by Odell in 1981. I don't think he even realized what he was getting into there, but um, it was a good start. And um, one of probably the most um, guiding books at the time was written by Leslie Hart, Human Brain and Human Learning, in 1983 which is when he made the suggestion that it would be silly, it's very silly of educators to pretend to design educational experiences. This would be like um, somebody who doesn't know the brain shouldn't design educational experiences because this would be like asking somebody who doesn't know what a hand looks like to design a glove. And this made a huge impact on educators of the type, um, at the time. Sorry. Um, Howard Gardner, who did some of his first work in the Boston's Veterans Hospitals in the 70s, actually uh, one of his first books uh, related to the shattered mind, uh, shattered brains uh, that he found in, in the Boston um, Veterans Hospital actually helped establish this idea that there were different islands of abilities that, that could be combined or retained even after there was damage to the brain. So this broadened the idea about what intelligence was in the human brain and where it could be found. There were also other theories in the 80s about connectivity, cognitivism, uh, constructivist models that began to become popular in the 80s. And there were several new organizations that started to be born around this time. Um, there was a declaration of the birth of neuroscience between uh, 84 and 1989 uh, when the first books um, were published in, with, these, uh, with this name. Um, then there began to be a huge interest on the part of educators. Educators began to look at the brain a lot more seriously um, in the 80s, in the early 90s. Again, pushed by the decade of the brain, it sort of... Mm, it was a false, false hope for a lot of educators. They thought, well, well, now that we can finally see the brain, we can finally figure out how, to, how this whole thing works, and we will be able to teach better. This is still yet to happen. I mean, we're still working on this. Um, there were two huge categories of studies that came out of the decade of the brain. Uh, one was a module or domain-specific theories. So these were related to theories about how we read or do math or pay attention. Um, then there were other global theories relating to uh, theories of intelligence. Um, these were big things that came out of the discoveries that were happening in the 1990s. From there, um, there began to be hints at international cooperation. Um, by the mid-1994, 1995, there was a lot of um, looking across the Atlantic to Europe and, and back again to see if we could actually um, join uh, efforts um, with different institutes. For example, the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Germany was very, very instrumental in pushing uh, some of these great ideas. And so there was, they were joined together by the James um, McDonald Foundation, um, which was very interesting. I'm sorry. Oh, start all over, Carlos. <laughs> 
in the 1990s, there was a great uh, effort, emphasis uh, now on international cooperation because now we're having better uh, communication um, abilities. We were also having far more cooperation. So, for example, the James McDonald Foundation, um, headed by um, John Bruner now, um, actually tried to link what happened in St. Louis to things that are happening uh, in Oxford, which was a huge thing. Uh, things occurring in the Max Planck Institute in, in, um, in Germany were also shared in the States. And then we're also looking not just across the Atlantic, but also towards the Pacific and trying to find better information from uh, researchers who were doing a lot of work in, in Japan. So by the time the 1990s uh, it was coming to a close, there began to be some skepticism. At the early 1990s, with the you know, decade of the brain, everything was good, good to go. Anything that had brain in it was believed. But then we realized this is not the whole, the whole uh, piece of information that we need. And um, uh, Brewer himself actually noted, you know, this is a bridge too far. This is way too far to connect these ideas of education and neuroscience. Um, laboratories are far different from classrooms and so uh, we began to have a lot more skepticism which was very healthy for the field because it tried to keep it honest and then um, there was a, a, a there was a big effort made to try to actually come up with some real tools what can we tell teachers about the brain so that they can actually um, be better equipped in the classroom um, types of best practice elements came out these were very nice but they were they were, again, still a little bit lofty. It wasn't until, actually, Branford Brown and Cocking's book, um, How People Learn, um, by the National Research Council, that we were actually able to get um, actually some high-quality information out there to teachers. So it's actually very relatively recent in the past decade that we've actually began to count on um, higher-quality information. Uh, during this time, in the early uh, 2000s, we actually started to see a lot of development of different interventions. For example, Fast Forward, Arevo, these types of reading interventions were, were new and they were based on this new cooperation that you could find in the field um, at the time. Um, from here we actually move on to see what um, dangerous things started to, coming, that started to come out of mind-brain education science, but not from the science itself, but basically because uh, of lack of communication. A lot was going on that was high quality information in academia, however this wasn't reaching teachers and so popular press started to fill in the void and started to have these uh, teaching in, with the brain in mind types of books which sold like crazy at the time. Um, same thing, learning the brain conferences, all these things started to pick up pace because people uh, were desperate for the information, they were looking for it, they were willing to pay for good information about this, uh, about the brain and learning and this was something that um, it was sort of a wake-up call that we have to start to judge the quality of information with a more stringent uh, set of rules because it was sort of getting out of control. There was a lot of junk going out there. There was a lot of uh, teach to the right brain kind of thing and boys need fire to start a class or whatever and they need to pass around a candle because of their, their basic instincts. There was a lot of junk going around. So. Um, this actually made a call for a lot the formalization of several new academic programs in the field. Um, Harvard spent several years planning to finally launch their master's program in the mind brain education field in 2001. Um, there was other things going on or, uh, however in Cambridge as well as in Germany as well as in Denmark um, and these programs have actually continued to grow around the world so many master's programs now in, in education have the slant of actually including uh, neuroscience and psychology in them. In the 2000s, there was continued misinterpretations of information. Um, for, these were basically blamed on uh, great overgeneralizations about information in the brain. Uh, there were a lot of books called right, right Brain Children in a Left Brain World or Right Brain Styles for Conquering Clutter and Reaching Your Goals or Boosting Your Brain Power in a Couple Weeks or Making Yourself Smarter. These are just very, uh, very good, popular titles that marketing people were very, very adept at, at uh, adapting to a, a, a population that's desperate for more information. Um, at the end, which is fascinating, in the 1990, 1995, Japan was taking the lead in neuroimaging technology, and in 2001, uh, Hideaki Koizumi, uh, through the Hitachi Medical Corporation, launched a new type of imaging. As we mentioned before, you could either measure your brain either through electrical or chemical changes or physiology. Well, they said, how about we look at this from a different angle? What if we measure this with blood flow? So basically, the idea is 
when a certain part of your brain is is more active, blood is flowing more to that particular area of the brain. And so they devised a way that was uh, very non-invasive. You can actually sit and watch people learning to play a song on a guitar with this on their head. You can, this is the closest we can get to actually being in a real classroom. So this, uh, this type of technology, which is bound to take off in the next decade, is what's going to allow us to actually do comparisons of what happens in your class versus my class and who's learning what and exactly what parts of the brain are being stimulated by this. So um, this is actually a very exciting time given technology. Um, the official birth of the new discipline um, was sort of uh, happened all around the world, um, more or less around the same time as we mentioned before, around 2000, uh, starting around 2004. There was this uh, cr sort of crescendo of all of these different efforts that had been taking a place uh, around the world in Japan, in Australia, uh, in Holland, um, in other parts of the world, not just in the United States. And there was a formal announcement of this uh, structure or this new idea of an international mind brain education society in 2004. Um, they actually had uh, the first meeting in 2007, and actually this whole thing took off around the world around that same time. There was a Mexican Society for Neuroscience and Education, which actually took off in parallel uh, in India and uh, England. Uh, all around the world, this was actually picking up as a phenomenon. So the new challenge now, given where we're at today, is still communication. There, it's still very hard for neuroscientists to talk to educators. In fact, I was at a conference recently where, in the most condescending voice possible, a neuroscientist told the audience, which is made up mainly of teachers, well, look, we've done all the hard work. All you have to do is go and apply it. And it's like this sigh went through the audience of, how dare they? They have no idea what really goes in a classroom, what really happens with real people in real jobs and in real places. And, you know, their theoretical information, uh, you know, of things that they're doing on experiments on, on rats have nothing to do with my own students, for example. So there's still this problem of communication. However, the International Mind Brain Education Society is growing. There's a lot more people who care about this good communication between groups and have spent a lot of time to actually try and facilitate exchanges between researchers in these areas. So you have people who are crossing the border. These are teachers going into neuroscience, or these are neuroscientists delving more into psychology, or these are psychologists who are going back into the classroom. And by pulling it all together, now you've got a new society of people who are actually agreeing that the best way to look at problems is through this multiple lens. It's not just through a purist point of view from their own profession. So anyways, the idea is to actually see how we can get neuroscientists, psychologists, and teachers to actually work together on real problems. Um, a final point in this chapter is to realize that there is a huge, a huge um, debate going on in neuroethics. Um, now that we're starting to know more about the brain, now that teachers know more about the brain, now that the brain information is now uh, more prevalent in society, shouldn't we be worried? Shouldn't we be scared that, uh, you know, yes, I can look at a brain and know that it's uh, got dyslexia. Uh, is that legal? Should I ask for brain scans of my students before I let them into my school? Because I know that's a lot more work, a lot more investment, a lot more resources that are gonna go into that kid. Or is that unethical? Or if I know, that a Joe Average college student who takes Ritalin who doesn't have ADHD is actually going to perform better on an SAT um, than one who didn't take the drug. And just because he has the money to pay for it, should he be able to pay for it? So anyways, these questions still have yet to be answered and they are very, very important for all of us to look at. Um, the idea was that we went from uh, kind of looking uh, at the global global person, um, and, and then we went back to having interdisciplinary vision. And we're, that's where we are right now, again, trying to look at this uh, from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. Additionally, we went from thinking that everything was behavior then to everything is definitely biology. And the key point here is there is no such thing as this biological determinism. I mean, you are not only your genes, although there's a lot of argument now saying that a lot is determined by your genes. In fact, the way you are reacting to different information is based on what you were given um, 
and your genetic makeup. So there's a lot to be discussed still about whether or not, I mean, that debate hasn't been closed. What's more important, nature and nurture? And teachers will inevitably tell you it's got to be, it's got to be the, your upbringing. It can't just be your genes because we believe that we can change people. <laughs> so there's a huge, um, there's a huge, there's a lot invested in believing that, um, that the, the brain is malleable and can be changed by experience. So we have to actually put all these try to try to put all these pieces together and to see how this impacts our own profession there's a great number of societies and tons of conferences that go on related to this field around the world these days uh, highly recommend that you attend some of these uh, there's one in Ecuador in 2013 we're hosting the International Mind Brain Education Society conference here in Galapagos and in Quito and hope you guys can make it to that Okay, that would be the end um, of chapter three, and we're going to now look at what we have in chapter four, which has to do with getting rid of the myths that plague the field of mind-brain education science. Chapter four is related to sorting the science from the myths and establishing goals and standards in the field. And so there's always been this debate, should this be a new field or should, is it a subfield of something else? And so basically, um, one of the things that called um, attention to to the fact that it has to be its own unique field is that in some fields, for example education, um, we put a lot of stock into qualitative analysis, uh, perspectives, um, understanding visions of, of individual people. Whereas in neuroscience they put a whole lot of stock into things that are quantitative, that are measurable. And what mind brain education science is trying to do is to bridge those two. And so what is uh, what do we actually try to use as a guiding um, quote, I would have to say, comes from Einstein. He said that everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. This is a huge point to keep in mind when we try to judge information. Just because a teacher can't prove that this particular thing worked in their classroom, um, because they haven't documented their practice very well, that's something we have to be you know, self-critical about. We've been very poor in, in documenting what happens in our class on every day. Uh, experiences. But we have to realize that we need to begin to document a bit better, but also the neuroscientists have to actually buy into the idea that, you know what, our observations are valid and there's a lot of good information that can come from that. Okay. Um, following this, uh, in this chapter, we actually look at uh, things that have to do with policy, um, things that have come out of this. If we know, for example, that uh, it's a bad idea, uh, given mind uh, and body balance, for teenagers to start school so early because we really realize that the serotonin balancing doesn't kick in there until a little bit later. Uh, what are we doing? Well, we are establishing schools with a structure that's helpful to the parents to get to work on time, but we're not really doing it to maximize learning. And so some of the other issues that are coming out of uh, mind brain education science have to do with looking at issues of uh, sleep and eating patterns, exercise patterns, and things that happen in our schools. Okay. To determine what was a myth in mind brain education science, there were four categories of information that came from the OECD countries, which I mentioned in the first video. First, things that are well established. Second, what is probably so. Third, things that are intelligent speculation. And fourth, things that are actually neuromyths. Each of these categories was uh, then compared with what would be uh, acceptable evidence uh, from the lit literature that things actually um, occurred or not. Um, and actually judging whether or not they had limited effects or actually negative effects on learning. So these were concepts that we took that were um, categorized as neuromyths. Um, most of them had no qualifying studies or they had very, very poor, uh, poor studies or there were no discernible effects or there were no qualifying studies or they potentially had negative effects. And so basically the neuromyths are the things we want to stay away from. Okay, these are the things that are so bad that they poison our schools. Okay, As we mentioned before, the things that are well established, um, these are the types of categorizations that exist. Well established are things like plasticity, probably so are things like um, uh, sensitive periods versus critical periods, intelligent speculation has to do with things like gender differences, and uh, popular misconceptions are those things that are just neuromyths, things that are attractive, easy to sell, but they don't have any science behind them. So. Having decided, um, given those categories, the, um, the Delphi panel came up with their decisions about what was good information or bad information. And from that, um, there was, a, gener there was a, a very important discussion generated which had to do with the goals in the field. 
So in this new discipline of mind brain education science, what are the research goals? And so basically some of the research goals that were established were to um, establish working understanding of the dynamic relationship between how we learn, how we educate, how the brain constructs the meaning, and how the brain uh, organizes processes. And so how do you do that? Well, you can study uh, brain mechanisms and the relationship to learning, or you can study relationships between human development and the biology of the brain. I think these pages, you know, 86 onward, are very important for those of you who are doing um, research projects and trying to actually decide or judge the quality of the topic that you've chosen. If you can meet these parameters, uh, uh, then I think that you're in good shape for actually choosing a good topic. The field also, or the Delphi panel, also looked at what were the practical goals of the field. And this is meant to do what? To align learning and teaching about how human beings learn and how they're organized, biologically organized for learning, so that we can make sure that we are actually taking advantage and maximizing the potential of every human being. So there's some suggested hows there as well. And finally, policy goals. Basically, we're looking to continually encourage the pursuit of neuroscientifically substantiated beliefs founded in educationally inspired research questions. So this means that it should go from the classroom back to the lab. It shouldn't start in the lab and then go back to the classroom because there's been a lot of poor information that's happened in that direction, okay? And then how do you do that? Well, you actually have to talk to each other. In order to, for, to make that thing work, you actually have to have better communication. This led to some basic standards or a suggestion of what kind of standards should exist. And the idea was that it is not this little intersection of the standards that exist in neuroscience and psychology and education, but rather the sum of the standards in each field, which makes each of the uh, pieces of information very, very stringently judged. Um, anything that you see in mind, brain, and education science that is actually legitimate actually has gone through the ringers. So you know that this is actually... Um, very good information if it comes out that way. Okay, this chapter is basically focused on page 91 related to myths. Myths like the humans, uh, humans only use 10% of their brains, or myths that the human brain has unlimited capacity. Those are two you know, opposing myths, but people still believe both of them. Um, some people still think that there are brain differences by race. There are not. Everything important about the brain is determined by the age of three. After that, it's just all downhill. There is something very important to recognize, and that re relates to uh, nutrition. If a child is malnourished for those first years of life, you have very little raw material to work with. However, an excellent book on this topic, The Myth of the First Three Years of Life, is, uh, is crucial to read for those of you who still think that if a kid has had a bad start, he will always uh, go down the wrong path. That's just not true. Other myths include things like uh, the brain works uh, in isolation. There's different pieces. There's left hemisphere or right hemisphere things that happen. Or that some people are more right brain and other people are more left brain. Those are just pure myths. Uh, additionally, left and right hemispheres are separable systems for learning. There's almost nothing that you do uh, on a daily basis that only involves one hemisphere. Uh, brains are objectively, uh, they objectively record reality. Sorry, it's not a tape recorder, and there's a lot of filtering that goes through past experiences, emotions, so no, it's not objective. Uh, memorization is unnecessary for complex mental processing. It's absolutely the opposite. We need memorization for complex mental processes. Uh, the brain remembers everything that's ever happened to it. No, even though you have these great movies with the hypnosis, who they can bring you back to places. Unless you paid attention, there is no memory that was formed there. So no, it's not that you can always remember or recall everything. Optimal periods of learning are connected to neurogenesis. That's just backwards. Teaching can be timed with synaptogenesis. If you can tell me when synaptogenesis happens, I'd be l really happy to know. This is... Um, <laughs> Neurogenesis is the generation of new um, neurons in the brain, right? Synaptogenesis is when there's new connections. As we mentioned before, synaptogenesis occurs when there's new synapses formed after what can be repeated experiences. So the moment that, that you have this new connection, um, this is uh, an example I gave in the first video when a kid learns to read. All of a sudden in that moment he just learns to read. Is it just that second where he really learned? No, it's because you've been building up that connection over time. So uh, anticipating uh, when synaptogenesis is going to occur is very silly because it's actually the opposite. Learning is defined by synaptogenesis. So you can't teach and time it to synaptogenesis. That's just silly and that's a great book title and it's sold a lot but it just isn't real. Uh, brain cells cannot be replaced. Sorry, they can be but don't tell anybody. It's not a like free license to go and do drugs or whatever. It's 
Uh, neurogenesis doesn't happen with frequency. It's kind of like menstruation. It's more or less once a month. Uh, it's only been identified in two parts, the human brain. Um, half of the brain cells die immediately anyways. Uh, half of that half, 25% actually try to connect on existing um, synapses, so it's, it's not new at all. So only about 25% of uh, new cells in the brain actually uh, go on to even have a potential to be uh, new synapses. So don't don't mess with your brain. Try to try to take care of it. The brain is not immutable. Uh, learning foreign languages disrupts knowledge of students' native language. That's ridiculous. I have three children. They know four languages each, and three perfe perfectly fluent, and uh, they're pretty balanced kids. Uh, children are born blank slates and all we have to do is just pour information into that. That's something that we kicked out in the 17th century. Um, brain and mind are separate. This is a very philosophical question, but I asked my students in neuropsychology to reflect on the idea. Can you have a brain and no mind or can you have a mind and no brain? And, and they always point to the fact that, yes, yeah, so you can have people who go there in a coma. So the brain is actually saying, you know, heart beat, heart beat, breathe, breathe, breathe but they are not present. There's no consciousness, so there's no mind attached there. Incomplete brain development explains teenage behavior. This is a good excuse for a lot of things, but um, even Jay Geed, who's done the only longitudinal study on the development of the human brain, does not um, say that kids are out for a free license um, to do whatever they please because their brains aren't fully developed. There's a whole lot of factors involved in um, teenage behavior. Um, one piece of it has to do with with uh, brain development, but uh, other things have to do with um, with uh, bad, bad friendships or terrible hormones or awful upbringing or other things that go on um, in a teenager's body, not only the brain. Um, reasoning is contrary to emotion. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It actually highlights the idea that you cannot make a decision without uh, emotions. Unstructured learning is superior to structured learning um, because of neurological functioning. It could be that unstructured learning, like discovery learning, which is very much um, popular uh, these days, there's a lot of merit to it, but there's a whole lot of merit in explicit instruction as well. So we can't um, say that the brain is better suited to one or another. Plasticity is a product of good pedagogy. Sorry, just not true. Uh, you have plastic, uh, plasticity with or without good teachers. Learning occurs only in the classroom. We know this is absolutely false. Uh, there's more experiences that actually happen outside of a classroom, so you have to balance all these things out. A student's history does not affect his or her learning. Absolutely false, because we know that all things pass through uh, prior memories. A student's history does not affect his or her learning, which is exactly related to this point. No, his uh, past experiences always influence new learning. Learning can be isolated from the social and emotional content. Absolutely wrong. We know that uh, social cognition is a huge element in learning itself, and so these things are all interconnected. Okay, um, I always think that teachers, uh, we should share the same first rule as doctors, um, do no harm. <laughs> so at a minimum, at a minimum, you do no harm. And in the best case scenario, you're actually forming good critical thinkers who throughout their life are actually finding problems, not only answering questions, but they're actually finding new ways to look at things. So. Um, the point is that many teachers, we grab onto information that exists or the, the best-selling book that's out there on the shelf and we use the information blindly without knowing or without realizing how much problems or how good or bad that information actually is. Um, we uh, have developed a, a, try, a trying to qualify what is good information or bad information. Um, Patricia Wolf in 2006 wrote a, um, a treatise basically saying, well, we actually have to look at the who, what, when, where, and why of a study and whether or not it has relevance. Because many people writing these books about right and left brain things, they say, but I base this on whatever. And that's fine, but it's studies that had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with the content that it was being applied. For example, there's a very popular author out there who sells a book about enriched environments and he, the only source he cited in one chapter had to do with NASA. And I looked up the study and this was about how plants survived in outer space when they were given a certain amount of oxygen or something like that. And he was claiming that this shows that kids in classrooms need light and air to, to, to do better. And, well, it's probably true that you, you know, they have no light and they have no oxygen and they probably won't learn. That's probably true. They probably wouldn't be alive. But it doesn't mean that that is a source for saying this is why we need enriched environments. So the idea is to actually filter through these things. So 
When we asked the Delphi panel, they actually came up with very specific um, um, filters through which you should pass the information, which is explained here. Um, also, this is a basic chart, you know, is this a peer review study? If it's not a peer review study, what do we do about it? How is the methodology and sort of analyzing if it is a peer review study? So basically, trying to determine whether or not the information you are actually using and applying uh, can pass uh, the, the, different, um, the different levels that we're talking about, or to be sure that it's good information. Okay, um, also you're asked to actually rethink um, the levels of thinking that, that are involved in human beings. Um, a new look at Bloom's taxonomy from 1956, we sort of relayed this out in a different way in a more iterative view to see how you could actually filter information against um, Bloom's taxonomy as well. Um, and that's the end of chapter four. In chapter five, we're actually looking what types of information came from the research, right? And what we actually wanted to find out in this chapter is to actually put into the context um, who was actually studied and where did good studies come from. So um, who was studied and why, basically you'll find that when you tallied up all of the different studies that exist in this new field, most of the studies happened with kids um, zero to five. Now there's a lot of reasons that could occur. Um, for example, the belief that not a lot of learning passed um, uh, beyond the early school years might be another reason that that was the main main age group. But what was kind of <clears throat> which was very um, interesting is to see that the number of studies actually was directly correlated to age, so or inversely correlated to age. So there are more studies on younger kids, and then there's less and less and less studies until you get through adulthood. So you'll find that there's far fewer studies. Um, on healthy adults than there are on, on really young kids, for example. And so, anyways, the idea is that um, we feel that this is probably going to balance out eventually, but it's actually something to keep in mind because it does help us um, identify that there is um, maybe skewed information and that we're making overgeneralizations about all human brains of all ages when really a lot of the studies are coming from really little kids, okay? Another thing we looked at um, had to do with different ranges of human abilities. So there were studies related to savants, people who had have this rare condition where they have this island of magnific magnificent, oh, they can also speak well. <clears throat> they have an island of ability when they have also just deficits that surround them in every other way. So these can be people who have mental retardation but who are geniuses on the piano, for example. We looked at gifted students as a whole. Um, we also looked at autistic um, individuals. Um, we looked at criteria for what is what would be um, highly intelligent versus you know average. We looked at students who had um, ADHD or ADD uh, to see how information or attentional pathways were different from um, quote unquote normal um, people. By the way, a big thing about normal: what is normal? Normal is what the average person does. So the n normal people will sleep, it's normal for people to sleep eight hours a night, but if people sleep four and a half to twelve, that's also okay. But it, the most, most people will sleep eight, therefore we call that normal, okay? We also did studies, or looked at studies that were related to um, people with half a brain um, to actually see, or this is what actually helps us dispel this idea that there is a um, localizationalism or certain part of the brain does a certain thing. We looked at brains related to dyslexia, um, to actually understand how the reading brain works better because by looking at brains that are different you actually get a better idea of how to summarize or actually to look at the global information about the average as well. Then we also looked at um, in this area what types of dimensions were looked at. So we looked at different skill sets uh, in individuals. Um, we also looked at things that had to do with um, social cognition or the uh, idea of cognition as a whole, how does one know, or metacognition or metacognitive skills. So theories of intelligence based on the information, if any of them had backing or support from mind brain education science. We also looked at the link between biological aspects of learning, including neurogenesis, plasticity, as we mentioned earlier, uh, neurosynapsis, which we talked about earlier as well. And then, um, very important for your group, I'm, I'm sure, is this idea between of the mind-body connection. Whether or not this link between things that uh, relate to sleep, nutrition, exercise have an influence on the body. Um, this is a very old, old concept, um, back from the Greeks and the Latin literature. You also find a lot of references to 
uh, an understanding that your brain can't work well if your body is not working well. But again, your body can't work so well if your brain's not working so well, or if your brain tells your body to do something to itself that is not correct. So this is a huge area of study um, that's very, very important because a lot of these things are outside of our own um, area of influence. For example, how long a person sleeps or how many hours a day a person sleeps and, and what would actually be good or average or normal or whatever. Uh, how much physical exercise does somebody get nowadays with all the policies that are taking out all those things from school? You don't have a lot of physical activity. Um, and hugely important is what goes into those bodies has a huge impact on the potential of the brain to learn. So these things are all important, but they're generally outside of the realm of what a teacher or what an employer can tell the people around them. I mean, you can try to lead by example, but it's very, very hard to you know, police what a person eats. Um, the studies were basically, now those, that's basically who is studied and, and, and what is studied. Now we're talking about how things are studied. How are things studied in mind-brain education science? Basically, um, the two key things are through either observation or through uh, measurement studies of brain activity. So observation, um, we sort of break it down in that way. We talk about neuroimaging and basic neuroanatomy and, and anatomical structures. So actually a general understanding of at least these core areas of the brain are very, very useful for teachers to actually familiarize themselves with. Um, from there, we also looked at how different types of studies were conducted, um, what they actually measured, whether electrical or chemical, in terms of measuring neurotransmitters, and what does uh, the measurement of different neurotransmitters, what does that mean about how you feel about learning experiences, um, the importance of emotional states, on uh, neurotransmitters, and also the concept of control, like uh, an emotion will occur, but what is your reaction to the emotion? So can you train yourself, even though, like let's say you're a Navy SEAL and you're underwater and you're, uh, part of the training is that I take off your mask, and your immediate reaction to that, uh, that emotion is a, you know this fear and panic and I need to get out of there. Well, can you dominate your emotions? So the idea is understanding what your body is feeling so that you can reinterpret the emotion mentally. So there's a lot of studies that are in that area which are fascinating. Um, uh, learning circuits, neurotransmitters, talked about neuro, neurological pathways as well there. Then we looked at different dimensions of things that are studied. So theories of consciousness um, are also covered in this book, but very, very, very briefly actually telling the types of studies of consciousness that exist and the mention that we had before related to neuroethics and the information that's coming out there, the types of questions we have to be prepared to answer soon. That's the end of chapter 5. And in chapter 6 now, okay, in chapter 6 we're looking at human survival and uh, life skills. Basically there are things that we need for school, like math, but there's also other things that help us survive in the, in the world independent of whether or not we know math or not. For example, whether or not we can memorize things or pay attention to things. Um, so this chapter starts out asking us basically, you know, how do we know about the world? And you basically have to agree that you know or, or that you can come to an agreement that you probably know about your world through your senses. Basically, um, the main thing, the main way you learn about anything is through one of your senses or a memory of that sense. So if we know that's true, then we have to understand basically how that works. We also have to know that aside from passing information through sensory input, we also pass things through a filter of culture. There are things you know, um, not necessarily, it's how you, you interpret them, how you interpret that sensate experience that actually change things. So, for example, when uh, somebody gets hurt and falls down and your sense of humor might be different in one culture to another, or your reaction, your physical reaction if somebody is harmed in front of you is different given your cultural upbringing, okay? Um, this chapter looks at the importance of affect, empathy, emotions, uh, and motivation, and how those are all um, uh, inextricably linked together. So that if you don't have uh, an understanding of emotions or your emotional processes or good emotional intelligence, if you're not able to manage your emotions, it's very hard for you to understand how you're choosing to make different decisions. And your decisions are, are directly linked to motivational levels. So the more you spend time on something, 
um, you spend time on things that you are highly motivated to spend time on. So if you don't make the connection between emotions, emotional states, the decisions you make about what you're spending time on, then you actually have a hard time identifying what is it that ha actually motivates you. And actually spending that time is what actually helps you learn things better. So the link between emotions, decision-making processes, and learning processes is a very, very important area of mind-brain education science. Um, this chapter looks into different issues uh, related to motivation, external motivation, um, internal, ex extrinsic, intrinsic motivation, um, motivational factors that relate to the other. So believing that your teacher knows what he's doing has a huge impact on whether or not you actually invest in the learning experience itself, which is fascinating. Um, looking back at uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, which has sort of been vindicated now in this new look at uh, the need to satisfy physiological needs, then safety needs, then social needs, and esteem needs, and then self-actualization needs, um, how that is uh, reflected in the literature and mind-brain education science. The second area has to do with executive functions and decision-making. So how are we in control? And this is the part that we were mentioning earlier about um, adolescents having a, that their frontal lobes might not be totally developed and therefore they're not making good decisions. Well could be, but there's an awful lot of other things that are going on that are related to um, bad decision making that are not just physiologically related. The third area has to do with facial recognition and voice interpretation. Uh, it's fascinating to realize that the human brain interprets and judges very quickly, almost instantaneously, whether or not we believe or trust someone by their look on their face and also by their tone of voice. This has huge implications in social cognitive, um, social cognition and, and also in the way we approach um, our classroom interactions or in our work interactions with others. Uh, your words might be right, but if your face or your tone of voice is, is uh, delivering a different message, that actually overrides the semantics, okay? Um, next area has to do with memory, which is the most studied area of the human brain. Given all of the different studies that are possible, uh, reading, attention, whatever, you know, memory outranks them all by far, and this has been a huge area of study. And the second area that has the most uh, studies is attention, which is not, um, not surprising because both memory and attention are vital to learning. So without memory and without attention, you have no learning. The next section has to do with the specific field of social cognition, how we understand the other. Um, this has a lot to do with this concept of theory of mind and the idea that you can best learn about yourself in the context of others. So you need to know others in order to know yourself. Uh, the next section has to do with spatial and sequential management, how things are ordered. Uh, this can be the word order in a sentence or in a formula, or also the order of steps that you take in processes. The next area has to do with time management. Um, and temporal sequential organization skills. These were uh, terms that were brought to light by Mel Levine um, in 2002. Um, aside from time management, these are things that help you get through life. You know, people who have a poor estimate of time are really going to be at a, at a loss for, um, for survival skills. In the uh, chapter six, we'll be looking at, let's see, in chapter six, we look at, um, I'm sorry, in chapter seven, we're now looking at the laboratory in the classroom or the most studied academic fields. Um, basically, the concept of this chapter, the main focus of this chapter is understanding that the, of the, the role of um, diagnosis. I mean, it's not that we are doctors, but it's a similar situation. A kid comes to you and they've got a gap between what you want them to know and what they should know. And so you have to analyze that gap to be able to understand how to teach or wh what to teach towards. So understanding where a kid is having trouble or diagnosing his problem is the key, is the key to actually better interventions. Um, and in, the, in terms of mind-brain education science, this is where precision comes in. For example, it is a crime for somebody to say a kid has a language problem unless they can be precise and say what part of language. Is it in uh, humor interpretation? Is it in spelling? Is it in writing? Is it in receptive skills? Is it in expressive skills? Unless you can actually break that down, you're not doing that child any service. You're actually just labeling him with no good reason because unless you can find the sub-element that has gone awry, you are not able to treat that problem with any uh, success. For example, a sub-element of uh, language is reading and in reading we found that there's at least 12 different uh, neural pathways that are involved in the reading brain. If teachers would just understand 
that there are these 12 different subsystems, they would then be able to treat the child much better because they would be able to target the area that the child has difficulty in, as opposed to just uh, forcing him to read out loud when basically that might not be his problem. Maybe his problem has to do with an internal uh, sentence processing or sequential ordering of the, of the words. So actually analyzing and understanding what the child doesn't know is your best bet in actually treating that problem. Um, there are many sub-skills that are related to reading and teachers have to become more aware of these things. There are certain new language interventions that exist now that um, I mentioned earlier, Fast Forward, Revo, WiggleWorks. These are things that are based on information in neuroscience that are being experimented with today, but each one of them acknowledges that they are only dealing with a single piece for example, of that reading puzzle, which means that unless a teacher knows what they should be uh, treating that kid for, they might be treating them wrong if they do these interventions. So you have to first diagnose and then choose the intervention. The exact same process occurs with math. We know that there are also at least 12 neural uh, pathways related to mathematical skills as well. Um, once those are broken down, the idea is can we help make sure that kids know each of those pieces um, to be able to do the math better. Uh, there are just a few uh, interventions that are out there um, trying to use the neuroscientific information to actually better some of these uh, skills. For example, the number race is one of them. But they, they also acknowledge this is just to deal with one type, one sub-element of math. So it shouldn't be overgeneralized. Um, there are some studies in science. The concept, there's a lot of interesting information that shows that teaching science through analogies is highly, highly successful. Um, other information related to art, creativity, how do we stimulate those areas better? Well, the main thing has to do with breaking them down into their sub-elements and then looking at the pieces that correlate with that in the neuroscientific literature. Uh, music is also included here. In Chapter 8, we look at evidence-based solutions for the classroom and actually trying to figure out what is the usable knowledge that actually comes from this. Um, one way to do this is go to the from the classroom and back, and this is actually figuring out what is it that great teachers do? And these uh, basically make up the core uh, principles um, that we have in mind brain education science. Great teachers know that each brain is unique and uniquely organized. These are based on things that we have uh, that are, have a lot of evidence behind them, right? So starting here on page, whoa, whoa. So basically, if we look at the principles starting on page 206, you'll get information which is very, very interesting because principles are basically the pieces of information we have about the brain that serve pretty much uh, the same way for all teachers, not specific to age groups and not specific to culture. These are basically pieces of information that any teacher could apply to their classroom. Um, after seeing the principles, um, starting around page 220, you actually look at a different set of information which has to do with things that are tenants. These are things that are important to all learning experiences, but they're actually relative to the learner. So there's a lot more human variance in this. For example, if we say that good learning environments are key to learning, that's great, but what do you consider a good learning environment? Um, what do you consider a secure place to learn or intellectual freedom? freedom? There's a lot of leeway there. The same thing related to sense, meaning, and transfer. These are related to individual experiences in a constructivist way. So it's very hard. We know that while these tenets are true, we have to know the students before we can actually say how we can apply this. The same thing is that there's different memory pathways given what the past experiences of individuals are. So we can't generalize those too much. Uh, same thing about natural attention spans of individuals. How long is an attention span depends on the individual as well. We can say in rough terms, between 10 and 20 minutes is about the outside stretch for um, a middle school kid to be able to pay attention. However, different kids have different ranges. Um, the social nature of learning, given a choice, most people would not choose to be on a deserted island and live their lives by themselves. Most people choose to learn in a group situation. So how do teachers take advantage of that? We also know that there are a different, uh, huge impact of mind-body connection that we mentioned in the earlier chapters. So policies related to food or sleep or exercise uh, within a, uh, a school setting are very important. The belief that there is orchestration or midwifing is, uh, goes back to our um, acceptance that there's a huge range of human potential and that not everybody fits in the same uh, narrow range of, of average. So we have to be able to deal with all different kids in our class and orchestrate their integration.
Um, we realize that active processes in the classroom are very important, that kids who do things actually um, actually actually have a better memory of those uh, same experiences so actually getting them to actually participate in activities helps learning experiences. Um, the idea of metacognition and self-reflection and skills is hugely important but you also have to develop these individually. How does a kid learn how he learns? Tell me Johnny, that was great, you answered that question perfectly. How did you get that answer? So having a child reflect on their own processes is very important in, in uh, learning as a whole. Um, we also accept that learning occurs through the lifespan. Uh, there is no um, critical period for any academic subject, as we mentioned before. You can learn math or learn to read or learn a foreign language at any other point in your life. The only thing that's really important is that the order of the processes that you learn, not the age at which you learn them. Okay, in the conclusions, in Chapter 9, we look at the conclusions and what we're basically trying to set the stage here is to actually encourage this concept of a, a, a research practitioner, a teacher practitioner, somebody who's actually involved um, but actually is documenting their practice. And this can be not only in the teaching profession but any of the professions that we're mentioning that, that could be involved in the health profession, for example. People being able to document their research and being able to judge the quality of the information that's out there so that they can actually choose what is integrated into their own um, work or, or within their own colleagues or the students that they deal with. Um, a second point that's hugely important to emphasize is that we're leaving um, an undeveloped list of vocabulary. Um, just looking at the way the Delphi panel had to define learning on page 233, this huge, long, massive definition is related to the idea that it's very hard to satisfy everybody's um, understanding of that concept. So the idea, what does the word learning mean? It's a very, very large, long and cumbersome definition because we don't have a refined vocabulary uh, left yet. Um, uh, Shashank Varma, Emma Candless, and Mark Schwartz tried to work together to actually identify why there were problems in vocabulary between neuroscientists, psychologists, and educators, and health professionals. And, you know, at some point you have to agree to disagree, but the other idea is that you should actually try to see if there is a way that we could come closer to being able to, to share enough of each other's vocabulary that we can actually um, work closer together. Uh, to close, I'll just read this last paragraph of the whole book. It says, to close, it's worth remembering. At the start of this book, I mentioned the insightful work of Bruno de la Cesia, Vanessa Christophe, and Christina Hinton. These researchers and pioneers in MBE science noted three main characteristics of those people who will move the discipline forward. First, we need people who are willing to share knowledge outside of their parent discipline. Second, we need people willing to adapt their language to a wider audience. And third, we need people who realize that connecting information across different fields and viewing problems with an interdisciplinary lens will end up not only nurturing their own perspectives, but those of others as well, and for the benefit of all. These new roles for educators, psychologists, and neuroscientists, and health professionals, I would add, require a level of in, um, initiative uh, which has never been asked or requested for of anyone before. While everyone may want better communication, more collaborative research, and shared language, someone has to be the catalyst to get the ball rolling, and this is an invitation to do so. This means that you, now armed with this information in brain, brain education science, will hopefully be open to taking a leading role in actually getting people to share information, for looking for joint research projects, to try and go across cultures to actually extend hands to uh, other people around the world to actually do comparative research on these different things. Um, I hope you feel empowered to do that, and um, please uh, let me know if there's any way that I can be of help in your, in your uh, research in the future. Uh, again, my email, tracy.tokohama at gmail.com. Um, always open to your uh, comments and queries. Thanks. Bye-bye.